Document 4.4, Witchcraft and Infanticide, 1753. Introductory Commentary. The investigation and prosecution of Yevka Stanoreja for infanticide and witchcraft allows us to see into the specifics of magical and religious beliefs and practices of the complex multi-confessional society of this border region under Polish-Lithuanian rule. It uncovers a set of ideas about witchcraft that incorporated some of the tropes circulating in the Catholic world, ideas about witches' flight and perhaps about witches' Sabbaths, tropes rarely seen farther east in the Orthodox world. The influences of Roman Catholicism and its demonology are evident in the Ukrainian areas, in part as a result of the 1595 imposition of the Uniate Church, which allowed for Orthodox ritual, but required obeisance to the Roman Pope. As time went on, Catholic influences became stronger as literacy increased. This case also exposes the harsh exactions of Magdeburg law, revealing a sinister aspect that can come as a surprising discovery in a form of law often touted for its respect of the rights of urban citizens. Here we see both the court's commitment to a full investigation and its willingness to use cruel torture to elicit the truth it had already predetermined. The multi-ethnic and multi-confessional town of Izyaslav, where this case takes place, was located in the deep southern part of the Palatinate of Podilia, which belonged to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at this time. It was not far from the border between the Commonwealth and Moldavia. Izyaslav was situated about nine miles from the city of Kremenets, a regional center, Needing to interview as many people as possible in this ongoing investigation involving witchcraft and, and infanticide, the officials traveled from Kremenets to Izyaslav and conducted their investigation there. Geography, or more precisely, geographic imagination, plays a significant role in this case because the defendants repeatedly emphasized that witches and their crafts sprang not from local sources but rather from a hazily defined Ukraina, which they insistently located outside of their own Palatinate of Podilia. They referred, for instance, to the village of Shvaikivka in Ukraina, where witchcraft was allegedly widely practiced. This village was located on the western border of the Palatinate of Kiev and the Palatinate of Volinia, just north of the border of the Palatinate of Bratslav. Testimony from this case suggests that the borderland figured in the local imagination, not only as a locus of witchery, but more generally as a place of freedom or license where the normal rules of respectability were loosened. Perhaps because of the anonymity it offered, it drew people like the defendant here who testified that, quote, Lesko also tried to make me leave my husband and to run away with him to Ukraine, unquote. By the mid-17th century, the shifting boundaries of Ukraina had become associated with the freebooting Cossack polity that had developed in the three eastern palatinates of Kiev, Bratslav, and Chernihu. By the 1667 Truce of Andrusova, these territories were divided along the Dnipro River into right bank Ukraine, which was under Polish rule, and left bank Ukraine, lands to the east of the river, and the city of Kiev, which were under Russian rule but enjoyed autonomous status. It is interesting that even though the Polish government had severely restricted the Cossacks' autonomy in the right bank, the participants in this case of witchcraft continued to imagine the right bank, which was to the east of their village, as a place of greater freedoms. After 1667, Cossacks on both sides of the river began to refer to all the former territories of the Hetmanate as Ukraine. As demonstrated in this mid-18th century case, these villagers had embraced that understanding. Because their village had not been part of the Hetmanate, they viewed Ukraine as another region altogether. From the perspective of witchcraft, the village of Shvaikivka, where witches ostensibly offered their services, constituted a lim liminal space 
it is not coincidental that crossroads and transitional zones at the edges of villages were perceived as liminal spaces as well. These were places where evil could linger and a battle between good and evil could take place. In 17th century Polish Catholic polemical literature, witches' orgies featuring the devil and his demons allegedly occurred there, and sometimes more specifically atop the folklorish Bald Mountain, the location of which varied according to author and witness. Descriptions of such orgies were nevertheless absent from early modern Polish and Ukrainian witch trials. Fittingly, the alleged witch in this case confesses, if only with the application of torture, to having learned to fly at the border between what had been the older but short-lived Cossack polity and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The liminality of a border was not limited to associations with witchcraft practices. In the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, a village or town border also served as the location of the public burning of a witch. The punishment took place at the end of the road and a witch's ashes were scattered to symbolize her complete banishment from society. Readers may be puzzled as to why the magistrates did not pursue further investigation of the women the professed witch Oreshka identified as fellow witches. According to Magdeburg law, at least two or three reliable witnesses to malefic magical practices were necessary for cases of witchcraft to proceed. Those witnesses did not materialize in this case. In the end, the magistrates did not view Oreshka to be a credible witness because of her constantly changing and what they termed her nonsensical testimony, and the accused women denied any knowledge of witchcraft. Consequently, the judges had no choice but to let them go. We should note, too, that a number of Jews testified in this case. Magdeburg law permitted Jews to testify if there were at least two Christian witnesses and a second Jewish witness as well. But local circumstances often led to modifications of these provisions. In this case, the Jews' accounts were taken seriously, unlike those of the accused, and the collected testimony highlights a society in which Jews and Christians interacted routinely in their daily lives. The linkages between infanticide and witchcraft in this case points to the interrelationship of issues of fertility, healing, and bewitchment. Unexpected pregnancies, whether considered legitimate or not, constituted a perennial problem in early modern societies. All over Europe, healers, midwives, and alleged witches or healers developed recipes and potions for abortifacients made from plants with poisonous properties, such as hellebore, rue, and Queen Anne's lace. Spells whispered over the potions were believed to increase the concoction's potency. The document begins. Investigation in the town of Old Izyaslav, February 8, 1753. We, the authorities of the city of Kremenets, Mayor Jan Pavlovich, official Mikhail Yurkevich, councillors Vasil Oshkevich and Stepan Sichkovsky, together with Fedir Rozdolsky, who at that time was a scribe of the town hall of Kremenets, went to the town of Izyaslav to adjudicate the following criminal case. We summoned the mayor, Vasil Siletsky, and residents of old Izyaslav, Kirill Doroshenko, Rihori Zatsenko, Ivan Slutka, and the mayor, Filip Kanenko, and residents of New Yazislav, Stepan Semenovich, and Pavlo Mospanyu before us to listen to the ongoing investigation involving the accused Yevka Stanorecha and her mother Marushka Temchicha. According to the investigation conducted in New Yazislav, they had committed a godless and terrible crime. Even so, our Magdeburg court summoned community members of the village of Little 
Shurovitsky before us in order to understand the case better. They came before us and said, 1. Ivan Petrovich testified. The accused Yevka had committed a godless crime when she gave birth to a baby in his pig pen. She left it in the manure among the pigs and went off to the tavern. When my children saw the baby, they informed me about it. So I headed down to the pig pen and saw that the pigs had already devoured the baby's breast and little neck. I ran off to the administrator to tell him about it. After we thought about it, we decided that no one else could have committed this godless crime except for the accused Yevka Stanoreja. We went to the tavern, tied her up, and handed her over to the estate authorities. She came with us and publicly and freely confessed that she was responsible, but added that the baby was stillborn. To rid herself of her shame, she had left it in the pig pen. Two, the Jew Zander Kishmanovich, a tenant of the village Shurovichki, testified that the accused mother had stayed at his tavern. When people saw the pregnant Yevka, they bluntly told her, you are not just fat, you must be pregnant. Humiliated, she cursed them. Then her mother joined in and said, my daughter, you must be pregnant because most people suspect you are. Not accepting any criticism, Yevka began to swear at her mother and the other accusers, and she went on swearing and cursing. Three, community members of the village of Little Shurovichki testified that they had seen a baby in the pig pen belonging to the Honorable Ivan Petrovich, and we community members saw that the pigs had devoured the baby's breast and little neck. The baby was obviously born on time, but we didn't know if it was born alive or dead. She, Yevka, must testify about this in front of the court and your honors. Our Magdeburg court ordered the accused Yevka to come before us. She testified. I was born in the village of Pidlisci. My relative, Temko Merharovko's daughter, and my mother arranged my marriage to Temko Temrachuk of Pidlisci. I lived with him for six years, and we had two children who died there. After six years, my husband left me. I had fallen in love with a young man in Pidlisci named, named Lesko Romanchuk. For two years, I allowed him to commit a terrible crime. That Lesko also tried to make me leave my husband and run away with him to Ukraine. I did not want to, but for two years, I had intimate relations with him in the village. My husband left me because he caught me having sex with Lesko Romanchuk several times, but he still kept on coming back for me. However, I did not want to go with him because I loved Lesko more than my husband. We then conceived the baby I gave birth to in Shurovichki. I had felt it stir within me during the holiday of the Transfiguration on August 6. I realized then that I was pregnant and had been with child for a while by then because I had initially felt something at the beginning of the Assumption fast. Then I left Pidlisi for Shurovichki, where I stayed three weeks. People insulted me there, saying, you are pregnant. I protected myself, and I hid my shame. When the baby's time came, I took my things from the Jewish tavern and went to Ivan Petrovich's pig pen. When I got there, the pigs were elsewhere. I quickly gave birth to a dead baby, and having held it in my arms, I left it there, covered up, and went back to the tavern. A Jew entered the tavern and announced they had found in Ivan Petrovich's pig pen a dead baby whose breast and little neck had been devoured by the pigs. I confessed that it was my baby. 
and when community members arrived at the tavern, they took me to the estate authorities. After hearing the free confession of the accused Yevka Stanoreja, our court ordered the accused mother, Marushka, to appear before us. She testified. My daughter went to the village Shurovichki where she stayed three weeks. She did not admit to committing any evil deeds. When I tried asking her several times if she was pregnant, she answered rudely. It was only after she had given birth and the baby was discovered that she confessed everything to me, saying that she had conceived the baby with Lesko Romanchuk. But she said that the baby was stillborn and I do not know any other bad things about her or myself. Having listened to the testimonies of both sides, our Magdeburg court of Kremenetz found the information wanting. This is why we postponed the next hearing until Monday, February 12, at 6 o'clock. On February 12, both sides appeared before the court. The community members of the village Shurovichki repeated their initial testimonies. However, the accused stood and said, I poisoned that baby with the encouragement of a girl named Oreshka Lechmanicha after I confessed everything to her. She responded, I will give you a potion and you will lose that baby. She gave me the potion in Pitlisi on the holiday of Most Holy Mary, according to the Greek rite. But I did not drink it until the pre-Christmas St. Philip's fast. And on the third day, almost as soon as I had taken it, I lost the baby. Having given birth to a stillborn baby, I buried it in the manure among the pigs. It was found only on the second day after I did this, and its breast and little neck had been devoured by the pigs. Our Magdeburg court has heard today's confession of the accused Yevka Temrachushka. Because she did not tell our court what we wanted in her first testimony, and this time it came out that she was encouraged by the girl Oreshka, who gave her a potion to poison a baby, our Magdeburg court wants additional information. That is why we are sending her to be tortured. According to the law and statutes, our hangman should thrice stretch her on the rack and simultaneously burn her hands with candles. This will help us come to a better decision concerning the case involving the community of little Shturovichki. When she was being sent out to be tortured, the accused Yevka did not admit to anything new. She only said that she had committed that crime because Oreshka had given me a potion with which to poison the baby. The court took that into consideration. Since she had confessed this freely without torture, and the plaintiff, the community of the village of Shturovichki, could not be tortured, we summoned Oreshka Lismanica to appear before us on February 14 to testify without torture. We also wanted her to look into Yevka's eyes and for Yevka to look into hers so that they would confess to committing that godless crime. The accused Oreshka confessed without torture. I am very familiar with that potion. It's called Philip's potion. You won't find it around here. It's from Ukraine and it's good for all kinds of evil undertakings. If a pregnant woman drinks it, she'll lose the baby immediately. That potion is also good for those women whose husbands left them and who want them back. In this case, you should heat the potion over a fire and say the following, cook, cook, help me. And then a voice from the potion will ask, what do you want? And you should answer at once. I learned this from people from Ukraine. 
nearby Berdyuchev in the village of Shvaikivka. They showed me this potion, which is good for all kinds of evil things and acts, so I am very well familiar with it and know how it works. I made Yevka Stanorechka lose her baby, and she also asked me to give her some potion that would make her husband die. So, our Magdeburg court heard the torture-free interrogation of Oreshka. Since she voluntarily confessed committing all those deeds and to the fact that she knew all of the evil acts, but did not admit that she incited others to commit evil deeds, she had to look directly in Yevka's eyes and claim that Yevka had asked her for a potion to kill her husband, and the accused Yevka did not accept that accusation. Our court sent the accused Oreshka to be tortured in order to obtain more precise information. She was to be stretched on a rack by the hangman, and she was to hold a burning candle in each hand. The hangman was ordered to burn her with those candles. For the purpose of a fuller record, she was asked the names of people for whom she used her witchcraft, who asked her about it, who taught her. Confession of the accused Oreshka under torture. One, she said that she had obtained the potion that she gave to Yevka for the evil deeds from a man called Ilashuk. Two, she did not, did not answer one of the questions above. Three, she confessed that Yevka did not ask me to give her a potion to make her husband die. She asked only for a potion to get rid of a baby. I know many things. There are four like me in the village of Dunkovtsi. The first is named Onesheha Tatsheha, the second Nastya Jersheha, the third Hanja Hurkovska, the fourth Zavatska. They take milk from cows, send down rain and hailstorms and know how to do many other evil things which they taught me. I went with them to the border a couple of times. We did the following. On the first Thursday of each month, we gathered together at Zavatska's place. She ordered me to fly, giving me a birch cane with bass fiber attached to it and telling me to mount it. And so I flew after them, but I did not know how to fly very well. I fell off that horse at the border and hurt my nose and back. I stayed with the Ukrainian witches near Berdyuchev in Shvaikivka on the cave Palatny border. I remember well the first and second names of those four witches who showed me everything. Verdicts. Our Magdeburg court, taking into consideration the oath, and having learned the existence of what had happened, ordered. For the sake of public justice, the accused, Yevka Stanorecha, must be beheaded with the sword by the hangman on the grounds that she fed her own baby to pigs. In fact, according to the law, the correct punishment for such a crime would be to shred her breasts with red-hot pincers and then bury her alive and pierce her with a stake. But our court decided to be merciful because such a punishment can be upsetting and unsettling to people in the community. Thus, we dispatched the accused to be beheaded by the sword. Concerning the accused mother, Marushka Temchecha, although we did not discover any evidence that she had committed evil deeds, we decided that she was guilty and thus ordered her to lie prostrate during Mass in a Catholic or Uniate church on any holiday on five separate occasions. This is her punishment for not teaching her daughter properly and for allowing her to commit adultery. As for the accused Oreshka, the court decided to summon and await the appearance of Onoshecha, Tatshecha, Nastya, Jershecha, Hanzia Hurkovska, and Elizaveta Zavatska, who dabbled in witchcraft 
and other unworthy things. They were ordered to appear before us on the 15th day of February. On February 15, the accused Elizaveta and Motra Onoshcheha came before the Magdeburg court. None of them confessed to anything. During the interrogation, free of torture, Motra said, I know nothing about witchcraft, and I do not know that girl Oreshka. I saw her only once when she came to me to ask for some fire. Elizaveta Zavatska said the following words, I also don't know anything about evil deeds, and I was accused for no reason. But I have heard from individuals, in particular Roman Tach, who reported to his honor master Nepokalczewski that Hanja Hurkowska had collected dew after the holiday of the intercession of our most holy lady of the veil, and then that dew turned into milk. But I do not know how to do anything like that, and I do not know any evil things. When the accused Oreshka stood before them and looked them directly in the eyes, she said, You are witches. But our court still does not have any confirmation of that accusation to proceed. In this case, where on one side, Elizaveta and Motra have been denounced before the Magdeburg court by Oreshka, who in turn had been denounced by Yevka on the other side, our court heard free confessions as well as ones extracted by torture. We discovered that Oreshka had given the accused Yevka some potion to drink to get rid of an unborn child, and today she confessed that they both drank that potion to prevent pregnancies altogether. Also today, she said, staring into the eyes of the accused Elizaveta and Motra that they were witches. And those accused and summoned here did not accept the charge and did not admit to knowing evil things. Our court took all these things into consideration. Since the accused, Oreshka Lichmanacha, had been summoned before the court several times, and each time she gave a different account and uttered nonsense, we order that she be sent to the same school where, as was Yevka Stanoreja, where she is to be punished with corporal punishment, that is, with 50 strokes of the whip by our hangman, Anton Kadrutsky. That punishment will be repeated every three months for a total of four times. So in total, she will receive 200 strokes. We do not have any confirmation of the evil acts of the accused and summoned Elizaveta Zavatska and Motra Tatsheha, which means that we cannot verify the information. But since our court is trying to detour witchcraft and inhibit witches, we order if in future the accused Elizaveta Zavatska and Motra Tatsheha, as well as Hanja Hurkovska and Oreshka Lichmanacha, or any of their descendants, are proven to have used any witchcraft or sorcery, whether in a few years or in decades to come, they will be burned alive as prescribed by Magdeburg law.